Let's see if we can shed some light on Sonnet 130 by William Shakespeare. Now we know that Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets and the first 126 of these are addressed to a man and the last number, so one, uh, 127 to the end, these ones are addressed to a woman. This woman has traditionally been referred to as the Dark Lady. The Dark Lady. And it's a nice phrase, but it may be a bit of a misnomer because we don't know if she was a lady, if she was an aristocratic figure. And we also don't know if she was literally dark. In this poem, it refers to the black wires that grow on her head. So she may have had dark hair. But in the very next sonnet, Sonnet 130, uh, 131, Shakespeare writes, In nothing art thou black, save in thy deeds. It's your actions that make you dark, right? They're almost criminal. How could you not love me? So is she literally the dark lady? Well, we don't know, but it's definitely a nice kind of romantic phrase, isn't it? This poem is not just about her, it's also about sonnets themselves. It's about the rage for the sonnet, uh, and that's hard to believe maybe now, but sonnets were really popular during this period. And in England, that really started in the early 1590s, especially after the publication of Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella in 59, uh, 1591. And that really started this kind of craze, this vogue for the sonnet sequence. And a sonnet sequence then is really just a collection of poems, a collection of sonnets, but it's always good to remember that we do have this larger context of all of these other sonnets and that sonnets can kind of start talking about themselves, right? Kind of like rappers do. They, they talk about their own songs and each other and so on. Um, and sonneteers or poets who write sonnets, they do the same thing. They talk about sonnets. And th this poem is really making fun of other sonnets, as we'll see. So these other sonnets, they're often very lavish in their praise. And the kind of sonnet that this one is making fun of has a name. Uh, this kind of sonnet is called a blazon. So a blazon. And you might see this with an S as well. So you can spell it with a Z or with an S. This term blazon comes from the world of heraldry. And in heraldry, what it refers to is a coat of arms or a description of a coat of arms. So either one of those will do. And you can kind of see how this is similar to poems that describe the woman's body. Because what they do is they describe her, they catalog her from head to toe. Every body part is sort of cataloged, right? And is praised, uh, lauded, and much too lavishly often. So if you look at poems from the time period, uh, just a few comparisons that, that you might come across, the lady's eyes are sometimes described as as bright as the sun. Uh, her teeth are like pearls. Uh, her eyebrows are like Cupid's bows, right? Because they're they're curved like bows, and you can shoot Cupid could sh shoot arrows uh, with them and wound you in the heart. It's all very melodramatic. So that's kind of what many of these sonnets were saying, and Shakespeare's making fun of that that kind of blazon. But this tradition of describing the woman in these lavish terms goes back much further than simply the late 16th and early 17th century. And just as a point of comparison here, I have a passage from the Bible. This is the Song of Songs from the Old Testament. And you can see that we have some very similar comparisons here in terms of how the different body parts are described. So we have the teeth, right? Like a flock of sheep. <laughs> Uh, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your temples uh, are like the halves of a pomegranate. And then this last bit is kind of interesting. Your neck is like the Tower of David. Most of us wouldn't describe a woman that way anymore. Uh, but it does kind of relate this to heraldry, uh, that there seems, seems to be some similarity between describing a coat of arms and describing a woman. Kind of fascinating, isn't it? Okay, so what is this poem then? Well, it's an anti-blazon. It's making fun of that kind of over-the-top description by giving similar over-the-top description, but now of the lady's worst parts. And uh, then we can see that this poem is not just about the woman, but it's also making fun of other sonnet writers. 
So now that we know some context then, we're in a position to go through the poem and make sense of a few difficult words. In the first uh, line, we have the word mistress. And the word mistress does not necessarily mean our sense of mistress. Uh, if you are being unfaithful to your spouse and you have a mistress on the side, that, that's not quite what's being meant here necessarily. During this time period, mistress could mean a woman in authority or it could mean a sweetheart, a beloved. And I think it's that second sense of my sweetheart's eyes that's more prominent here. Then we have the word done in line three here. And the word done means dull grayish brown. And we would probably say tanned. So what he's really saying here is that her breasts are tanned, right? And we would say, well, that's a great compliment. <laughs> uh, she can go to a tanning salon. But in, during this period, of course, uh, having white skin was seen as a mark of being aristocratic, being able to shelter yourself from the sun and not having to work outside in the fields. So this is not really the compliment that we might expect. Then we have the word wires. And this again is a bit of an odd one because we think of electrical wires, right? We want to hide any kind of wire we see. But you have to remember that this is before the industrial era. Uh, era. And so wires could be seen as a compliment. And in some sonnets, you actually have comparisons to let's say golden thread, right? Her hair is like golden thread. So he's basically saying, if hairs be wires, if you want to make that comparison, well, she's got black wires. She's got tarnished kind of wires on her head. Then we have the word damasked in line five here. And the word damasked means variegated or mixed. And you can think of uh, roses. So if you have a hybrid species of rose, then, then you have sort of mixed the colors. And he's, he's saying here, well, I have seen beautiful kind of hybrid mixed roses that are red and white, but I don't see those colors nicely mixed in her cheeks, right? Her cheeks are pale and they lack color. Uh, so don't expect to see any beauty here. And you can see now that this whole opening part is full of insults. He really says, well, my mistress' eyes are not as bright as the sun. They don't shine beautifully. Uh, Coral is a lot more red than her lips red. So th the red of her lips is, is not really there. Her lips are probably chapped. Uh, her breasts are definitely not snowy white and so on and so forth. One word that may need a little bit of clarification is this word reeks because for us, it, it really means to smell badly. But during this period, it probably just meant, uh, meant something like to come out of, to rise. And so it doesn't have to have that connotation of smells badly, although that, I th that is, I think, the implication that her breath is definitely not perfume. And then we get to the last couple of lines, and I think you can make sense of most of this in between yourself. So she's not a goddess. When she walks, she really kind of stomps on the ground. And then the last two lines are the most difficult. So these are the rhyming couplet, right? The last bit is the rhyming couplet. And Shakespeare writes here, and yet by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. This word rare is sort of a mix of marvelous, right? Special, but also unusual. And Shakespeare's kind of playing with those meanings. Uh, so you might translate this as something like unique, right? Both unusual uh, and special and wonderful at the same time. Think of a diamond in that sense. A diamond has those qualities too. The word she is the, the hardest word here perhaps because it actually just means woman. So don't think of it as the pronoun, but the pronoun stands in for the word woman here. So as any woman be lied with false compare. And then this word be lied means misrepresented. Misrepresented. And the last bit is false comparisons. And what Shakespeare is really saying then at the end is he says, and yet by heaven, I think my love, my beloved one, right? My girl is as unique as any woman who has been misrepresented with false comparisons. And what he's talking about is these blazons. All of these poets who go, ah, my beloved is so beautiful, right? My, her eyes are like the sun. 
her her lips is like or her lips are like uh, coral and shakespeare says none of these things are true they're all misrepresent misrepresentations they're all lies and in the meantime i'm telling you the truth so it may sound like i'm insulting you but actually you should love me because i am honest isn't that nice <laughs> so that's sort of the general argument here and what we have to make sense of then is this final kind of poetic turn as it's sometimes called at the very end we have this poetic turn where he goes okay i just insulted you for 12 lines but then when, when we get to the rhyming couplet i'm going to turn it around and say and yet you know even though i've said all of these nasty things i think you're special because I am being honest and I'm not telling you lies like these other poets, but I'm telling you how it really is. And I think you're unique, right? And that should count for something. <laughs> All right. So hopefully that makes some sense of the poem. Then we've talked about the context. We've talked about the basic meaning. The last thing we really need to focus on is what do we take away from this? What's the significance of this? And, and how should you interpret the tone and, and the meaning of this poem? And this is really where you get to analysis and interpretation. Uh, and if you're writing an essay, this is where you have to kind of make a statement or make a claim. So let's see what are some things that you can talk about in an analysis. The first thing I think that's important is simply your gut response to the poem. And I've sometimes asked students what they would do if somebody recited this poem to them, right? And the majority of students would actually say, well, I think I would slap that person in the face. I wouldn't put up with this. It may sound kind of nice at the end, but there's just too many insults and I can't forgive that. And then there are those kind of innocent souls, those, those wonderful people who say, ah, but he means so well, and I'm sure he's really kind. Uh, and maybe the ending, you know, makes up for everything that came before. So that I think is interesting, the way people respond to this differently. And that really does raise this kind of fundamental question uh, about this poem. And the fundamental question has to do with honesty. Is Shakespeare being honest? And what does honesty mean? Okay. Is he being honest? Because he sort of, sort of seems like it on the surface. He seems to be saying, well, all these other poets are telling lies, but I'm being honest. And I think one of the first things that comes out of that, that, that you have to investigate is, well, what is honesty? Is he really telling the truth? And I think if we have sort of this, this continuum, right, if we think of the, the extremes, then on the one hand, you have the blazon, which is over the top and is all lavish praise all the time. And then on the other extreme, you have insults. Insults. So where is this poem? Is it in the middle then? Is that honesty? Yeah, she's not extremely beautiful, but she's nice, right? Or does this tend more towards an insult? And I would say, well, it's actually way more on this side. And, and is, that, is that honest? Or is it really the pendulum kind of swinging from one extreme to the other? So that's one of the, the big questions that you have to consider. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with tone then. What is the tone of this poem? Is it sarcastic? Is it tongue in cheek? Uh, is it trying to be honest at the end? I wouldn't be too reverent towards Shakespeare. I know a lot of students that they've kind of encountered Shakespeare in high school and they kind of go, well, I have to admire this guy apparently. He's such a genius. He must be romantic. He must be serious. But no, really, Take Shakespeare as somebody who is trying to be clever, he's trying to show off, um, and he's not doing that just for his beloved, he's also doing it to have this kind of poetic competition with other people. And that gets at this, this question of audience. So who is the intended audience for this poem? Is this really addressed to his beloved? Well, I don't think so, because if you address a poem to your beloved, you don't say my mistress, you say you, right? Your eyes. So this is in the third person. It's all in the third person. It's saying she is like that. So who's he talking to? Is this like locker room talk between guys, right? Is this guys talking about a woman saying, well, my woman is like this. And other guys say, well, my woman is like that. It becomes this sort of competition between men. And I think that re should really trouble us. And it does lead to this, this larger concern 
over misogyny. So we have this larger concern over misogyny, and the word misogyny refers to hating women. Now, do we want to accuse Shakespeare of misogyny? Possibly we might, uh, because it might be actually quite a misogynistic poem. And maybe he's not just insulting one woman, but he's implying that many women are like this, and this is how you should treat them, right? Uh, because all these other women, they have been lied to. These other women have been lied to, uh, and what does that imply? That they aren't beautiful? How, how far, again, is this pendulum swinging, right? And I think that's sort of the, the bigger question behind it. So we have a question of honesty then, we have a question of audience, and what we're starting to see here is that Shakespeare is actually much less interested in the woman than he is in his own fame. It's this question of fame that's important. He's basically using her for fairly selfish purposes to make fun of other son sonneteers. And so she is there not so much to be remembered herself, uh, but to be kind of used and abused in some ways. Uh, so that Shakespeare can say, look at me, I'm so witty, I'm so clever, and I can turn it all around at the end um, and, you know, salvage something out of all of these insults. So those are really the fundamental questions that you have to ask. And I think by going through this, you might be a little bit confused. You might say, but that doesn't really help, uh, because now I have all these questions, and you know, I don't know if this poem is misogynistic. I don't know if, if Shakespeare doesn't love her. I don't know if he's being honest or not. Uh, I don't know how far the pendulum swings. But that's okay. You know, you, you don't have to settle all of these questions. You don't have to have all clear answers to every last question. And I also think that when you come to this poem again and you read it in relation to other sonnets, you start to see that there are 154 sonnets and they're all a little bit different. Each one is a little mini argument. Each one says, look at me, I'm so clever. <laughs> I'm a new attempt to get you into bed with me. I'm a new attempt to persuade you that I'm worth loving. I'm a new attempt not to persuade you, but to persuade others that I'm a clever poet and I should be remembered, right? There's all of these different arguments in all of these sonnets and part of it is, the fun of reading sonnets is just to see what Shakespeare can, can come up with. What kind of clever argument can he use now to try to persuade somebody? So that's a big part of the appeal of sonnets. And then, of course, we do have also those sonnets that are more romantic, that are beautiful, and so on. But I don't know that this one fits with those sonnets. This is a comical sonnet. It's a, it's a form of satire and parody. And so it's a little bit different than what you might find in a different kind of sonnet. But I hope this helps you make some sense of this poem. Uh, and hopefully now you can see how it works in relation to the historical time period uh, and the sonnet sequence, the sonnet form itself.